since I've been on the uh, banks of a lake doing some commercial carp fishing um, so that's what I'm planning to do today um, I've been coaching here today we're at Tunnel Barn Farm and um, I've had a lovely day fishing on Jenny's pool um, but it's been a little bit windy to say the least so I've, I've come round the back of house pool on a nice little peg I don't know if you can see that peg 22 on house down the little back arm love this area really good area um, a lot of people don't think it's very good but I, I think it's brilliant 21 and 22 especially cracking pegs so um but we're tucked out of the way hopefully out of most of the wind the light's a little bit funny um but it's a perfect time of day and everything to have a little play down the edge um carp o'clock as i call it or f1 o'clock um now margin fishing's gone a little bit moody in a lot of places especially here at tunnel barn farm but this time of day they'll definitely be there they should be here a lot earlier in the in the day um you should be catching them with at least two or three hours of the match remaining but they seem to be coming in in the last hour last 30 minutes sometimes on some of the pegs just lately i think they've been caught so many times since lockdown so um just a little bit pressure a little bit on edge but shallow fishing and fishing long and fishing on the deck still good the margins are a little bit moody but when they come in it's brilliant and i love this style of fishing so anyway i've come on the back of house pool to try and um have a little go very very simple tactics top kit top kit and one down the edge um i've got some new floats to play with some pablo rwc tanks now this is a float i've sort of come up with a little bit um not an original design by any stretch of the imagination but it's perfect for how i want to fish down the edge a nice positive bulk and a nice short stubby bristle float so uh that's what we've come to have a little um experiment with and a little bit of field testing today i'm going to fish pellets and ground bait um i've got some maggots on standby but to be honest i just want to catch on pellets if i can it's my favorite way of fishing down the edge don't catch any of them little waspy perch that uh drive me mad so i've got a camera there we should hopefully show my bites there <laughs> and i've also got a swim down my left hand edge which i might um i might fire up or not anyway look anyway i've not even plumbed up so i don't know but it it looks about right down there i've, I've poked around with a bank stick to uh to see but anyway that's what we're going to do i'm going to start right from the beginning um putting the rig on plumbing it up um and see i mean where i think i'm gonna fish i hope it plums up all right i felt around and it felt like it was about 12 to 15 inches which is ideal so um and left and right if not i'll have to go a little bit further into the second hole um but i want to catch nice and close if i can so uh, without further ado let's uh, switch the other cameras on and um start plumbing up first things first let's have a look at the bait tray hold that over there so i've got some fishery micros just normal two mil micro pellets I've got some um, dynamite green milled expander, which I really like. It's gone very green actually lately, I've noticed. It's a lot greener than it used to be. But it's still very, very good. I've mixed it on the damp side and then stodged it up a little bit. So it's a little bit over wetted, so it's nice and heavy and fully saturated. Um, so that's it. And then I've got a 50-50 mix of the two. I might alter the ratios, but a little dust in a ground bait and a bit of micros together. And to be honest, that's often what I end up fishing. To start with, I always start off with pellets on their own and the ground bait's there as a boost. If you feed ground bait too soon, your peg can go a little bit silly. So that's the plan. And I've got some four mil expanders. I normally bring some six mils as well, um, but just fours for the purpose of this and some, uh, just a very small amount of maggots as well. So uh, my rigs are tied up on 018 power micron. And these are me lovely looking tanks although one's just almost fell in um so there they are nice short stubby float so let's get it on the top kit right and as far as kits go i've got my favorite short kits which i'm a massive convert to now and um as i've shown in other videos i've got them marked up all the way along 18 24 30 inch all the way up to 66 inch um just so it's nice and easy for marking the depths and i've got 10 to 12 slick in there perfect for tunnel barn this time of year 10 to 12 8 to 10 once it gets a bit cooler and 6 to 8 when it goes into winter but um 
10 to 12 hours perfect um, anything less and it's a little bit uh, bit of a handful when you're playing some of these fish especially down the edge you could use 12 to 14 to be fair but 10 to 12 seems about right for all sizes of fish for me um, and that's it so it's uh, that one that I nearly dropped in we'll use those what are they 018 so I just mark it on with a pencil what I've got and I've dated chain two rigs on a winder because only small floats put more than one on a winder so plenty of line on that normally about an arm's length um, for this sort of game and so I don't get any kinking when I daisy chain a rig together so don't put the hooks on that's the loop of the second rig and that's uh, the hook length loop but it's nice and straight as you can see and uh, that's just a staple it's a little trick there she showed me years ago and uh, keeps all your loops nice and straight you see that one's come off the winder that's the main line loop and that's kinked and so that's what you're trying to avoid at this end the more important end the hook length end you see that so uh, but anyway that's just the uh, that's going to be chopped down eventually once I've got me uh, me length right so. and that's all I use down the edge this time of year 90% of the time it's just a solid bulk of number eights five number eights these ones take um, and then I've got a really short three or four inch hook length this one's actually three inches and that's 0125 power micron and a 16 prototype hook they are out now I'll I'll get told off for getting the name but these are out now I think they're the MXC MCX1 or MXC1 I always get them the wrong way around but um, that's what they are three inch hook length and then that's the float on its own it's a really short stubby float perfect for fishing tight in in shallow water and tight across in what they call the mud line two rubbers all I put on these glass stems um, when it's on the winder I often have it a bit lower but when I'm actually fishing I push it up that just stops kinking I have it down there until I'm happy with the depth I'm fishing and then I put it up there to once I'm actually fishing it just seems to stop kinking when you're sliding your float up and down a little bit and importantly that bottom rubber is overhanging slightly so it becomes a continuation of the float and cuts down on wrap overs and a nice short two mil hollow tip and what you call a hybrid eye I think you call that so anyway there's no chance of that getting ripped out perfect for this style of fishing and it's too long as it is so I'm going to plumb it up put it on as it is nice big loop no point having a little tiny loop at this end because it doesn't get tangled over I see itself put it on the old Dacron it's definitely too long to start with and my uh, oh, where's my plummet's gone there we are 15 or 20 gram plummet these ones are made for me by Mark Chanel down in uh, Cornwall or Devon or wherever it is Cornwall so a uh, nice little flat plummet nothing fancy but just really nice plummets right so we've got it about what we got there what did I say 16 17, 16, I can't count back with 15 inch. So let's have a look down the side. Obviously, it's way too long a line above it at the moment. Right. So it drops off. Oh, getting attacked by some sort of bug. Now, a lot of people would be fishing down there in that deeper water. But um, this time of day especially or when there's any number of fish competing I pull it right in so um, that's too a little bit too shallow at the moment a little bit bobbly so there's obviously some rocks or something so I'm just gonna try to float up a couple of inch not too bad it's, I'd like a little bit shallow if possible but oh, that looks all right it's catching on something so I've just got to have a little drag around and make sure it's clean it's probably just a little little bit of root or something oh, that's all right yeah but I can just see so I'm probably about an inch over depth there which for me when I'm pulling the rig in definitely some of catch in there so just have to be mindful of that yeah that's I'm not gonna at the venue like this you're not gonna find a flat bottom so I'd rather find the top of the slope and pull the rig into it. So we can just see a little bit of the body and uh, we're going to plumb up to that. 
just make sure it's not catching. That's where I want to fish because you're, you're fishing up to a wall so they can't get behind it too much. I imagine it is undercut there but in the main they can't get too far past your float. So it's probably well, less than a saucer size area but that's good enough for me. I'm just going to swing round and just see if I can find a similar depth this way. Ideally we can. So that ain't bad at all actually. So and it's about the same depth. Perfect. Right. So I'm going to trim that really short. Shorter than uh, a lot of people would think. So what's that? Three, four inch. No more. You see that? I'm going to use my loop tire. Drum through twice, so sometimes just moisten it. Biggish loop again. Cut that line, make sure it doesn't blow away. And then whack it back on the Dacron connector. And that little bit of excess line, pop away in the pocket. There we are. Right, so that is the depth. And I'm going to just check that. Take the top kit off. I've just put some tape on the bottom there just so I know which top kit is when it's on my roost. To be honest, it still get confused. So that is 16 and a half inches, shall we say. <laughs> um, but I am that much over depth, so it is 16 inch. But that's it. So as long as we know, I've got these markers, but what I sometimes do, if I can find it, the best way to mark a white kit, by the way, is what I found with a bit of ground bait on there. It's just to mark it with a little 2B pencil, just so I know. I know what it is. And that'll just rub off easily afterwards with a with an eraser. Something like that. Just so you know. So just a just a 2B pencil, just so I know that's the marker. I can remember the number, but to be honest, I've struggled to remember numbers. So I'm not going to put a back shot at the moment. It's not windy or anything. It's not going to get in the way, so that's a nice... What's that? One, <coughs> four inch above. No problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, fry in my throat. Um, so that's it. Really short rig. The whole rig is only 21 inches in total. Can you see that? So, but you can't get much simpler. Size 16 hook, three inch hook length, five number eights, 018 line, 0.4 gram float, 10 to 12 slick, short lash, as the northerners call it. Very, very simple stuff. Let's get catching. Right, so let's start feeding. No big pots in sight. All I've got is a short kit and a number three section and a number four in reserve if I need to add any pole. So it's just a number, a number three and four of me uh, MTX2 pole. And uh, put a pot on yet. Medium matrix toss pot. The flexi ones. These are brilliant because they've got the holes in the bottom. Absolutely vital holes in the bottom. Stops any vacuum forming. And to start with. I'm just going to feed with micros, just to begin with. Feed a full medium pot, time of day now, I can feed that amount. That's a lot of micros in there. But I like to feed a reasonable amount first. Dob in. Some people think that's a small amount, but for an F1 venue like this, it's quite a, quite a lot of pellets. So, we're going to feed them. Just there. Touch it on the water. Let them all cascade out. The holes in the pot help that happen. Cascade away. And then it might take a minute or two. If I was fishing elsewhere today, I would feed it. And then I would catch a fish somewhere else and then go back down and feed it. And then go on it. So generally I tend to feed it, wait three to four minutes and then go back on it. Don't normally have to prime it for any longer than that. In fact, if you keep feeding it and feeding it before you go on it, I think you do your peg more harm than good with F1s. The key is to try and catch them before they wreck your peg. Ooh. <laughs> okay. 
time of day, so that's brilliant. But no signs at all of a fish there. But he's had it straight away. Now this is a time of day now where we might catch an odd mirror as well as the F1s. Just got to be careful with them going around the platform leg. I think it's an F1. It's playing like an F1, but it could be a big mirror. Nice F1. We're off. Simple as that. One pot of micros. The first two or three are always quite easy to catch. The ones after that are the difficult ones. Once they start coming in and destroying your bottom, I call it. <laughs> so uh, we're up and running. So what I'm going to do, just repeat the process. Four mil expander. And then I'm not going to put so many marks in this time. I'm just going to half fill it. See that? Just put it in ever so lightly so they don't bounce out. The looser you can put them in, the better. Put me number three on. Um. Oh! Someone actually pulled that as I was tipping the pot bait in. Carp o'clock. I don't mind being easy today. That's a, that's a beauty of pleasure fishing. Getting plenty of bites. You catch 10 fish, jobs are good and go home. So it definitely had a tug at that as I was feeding. It just laid across its back. I think that bulk really close to the hook is really important because it, it helps stabilize everything really magnifies the bites. I used to go the opposite way with really light strung out rigs and I still think there's a there's a place for that but at the moment when you're fishing a, a nice trap of bait like I am at the moment if you can bosh that hook bait directly over it almost like a method feeder presentation it's awesome the bites are unmissable so I shall probably miss the next bite <laughs> well, it's great to catch one straight away. Often catch the e easy one straight away. Well, there's a there's a indication, a bit of a wobble, a bit of a tail pattern. In my experience, the more ground that you feed, the more they tend to waft around. So it's important to feed those micros as well. Something came into the peg, quickly vacated by the looks of it. Now this lake is a lot fuller than it normally is, all the lakes are, we've had no end of rain. The fish actually do seem quite happy to be in the shallowish water. Ooh, I told you I'd miss it, that was a funny bite. You having a few, thanks. <laughs> You're right. All right. <laughs> you see me again in a minute. You'll see me again on YouTube in a minute. I'm filming now. Brilliant. Oh, nice. You might not have heard that, but the guy says he's only had a pole for five weeks. And he's had a cracking day here at Tunnel Barn. And he's seen me before on YouTube. <laughs> he would have been on about house 33 there, I think. 32 or 33. Good peg on my favourite lake. little stocky or something. Stabbed at that quite a bit, it was a funny bite, so we'll see. But I don't know if you noticed that time, I actually fed it in a little ball, a little little depth charge as I'll call it. Ooh, 
don't know, it might be bigger than I thought actually. Maybe it's that's not an F1. <laughs> I think this would be a mirror or a common. The way he's fighting. What do I know? Might be a massive F1. It's a bit of a splasher. A bit camera shy. Get out of it. How not to net a fish. Trying to get under my pallet. Wow, where's he going? It might be a common. Oh, it is, it's a common carp. No wonder he gave me so much trouble. One of them scrappy commons. Yeah, I can see the barbules. Oh, all right. I thought it wasn't an F1 the way he was fighting and billowing in the water. That's gorgeous, see? Little barbules. Nice little common carp. A couple of pound, maybe three. Mm. There we are. Whew. Right, catch another. Yep, I'll show you what I did last time. Four mil expander, rolled on the hook, and so. And then, this, a little nugget like that. Sometimes you can make it bigger and then just break off a little bit to get the size you want. Some people struggle to make tiny little balls so uh, make a big ball and break it off is my little tip. That's a good sign anyway catching one of those down the side. Sometimes you can plop it in and really make a noise and they'll follow it down but I'm just sneaking it in at the moment. Them carp can upset the peg a little bit because they really stir it up. But they're nice to catch. They just fight a bit harder than the F1s in here, generally. And big two and three pound F1s tend to waddle around. So I can actually see the oils and pinpricks coming up off that little ball. So I know my expander is, is right on top of it. A little sway. This mega short line as well, some of the bites, the, they'll just hook themselves and the elastic will just stream away. The only problem you get is that little pole pot on the end can get in the way of you seeing your float sometimes. That's probably the only downside of these short lashes. A bit of a wobble again. Next time I'm going to pull it in loose again I think, or put some ground bait in. So you've got plenty to experiment with down that side, and every day is a bit different. So um, loose micros, a ball of micros, loose ground bait, a ball of ground bait, or loose 50-50 and a ball of 50-50. And um, you know, there's six options there. And every day is a little bit different, and every part of your session is a little bit different. I tend to start off with micros, because they can clean it out a little bit better, and they're not kicking up any mud or whatever's down there. But if they'll have just neat micros, everything's so much cleaner and easier. The ground bait's there to as more of an attractor. And some days they want ground bait and you won't get a bite unless you put the ground bait in. But we've had a couple of fish, an F1 and a common straight away, so that's nice. Go on, go on. Oh, a little fun. There's a little baba. Trying to get under my landing net. Babby one. Perfection in miniature. <laughs> right, this time we just used today as an experiment. We'll put some ground meat in this time. Put that one in the nugget this time. Just sits in that pot. Plop. And then follow it straight down. Right on the money. If the peg goes a bit silly, I tend to feed it more in nuggets. 
you need to draw the fish in and tend to feed it loose. It's all about trying to control your peg and controlling how uh, voracious the fish are and how daft they're acting in your peg. If you get too many fish in your peg, then you have all sorts of problems, which is why I've not gone in with a big pot. And it's why I'm not feeding loads. I'm just feeding for one fish at a time. We're primarily after F1s here. And generally, small amounts, little and often, is the key. If you feed too much bait on an F1 venue like this, it's a recipe for trouble. A few mil of the Bristol showing. You could show a lot more, to be honest. If there was a lot of fish down there, you could undershot the float a little bit. I quite like that amount. I can see I can see the bristle under the water as well, so there's plenty of visibility. There's no need to fish a finer bristle, that's for sure, like some people do. I think two mils absolutely perfect for this game. Just the right sort of buoyancy to stop it getting dragged under too much by liners. The tail pattern. daydreaming then I think I had two two goes at that bite so, I'm hurried to Lynette there we are. straight in another F1 so what's that four fish I'll try and get ten Plop. now even if I can see fish down there generally I will feed every time, regardless. So a little nugget, even if it's a little tiny pinch, like that. Because seeing tails and stuff down there, they're just spreading the bait everywhere. So you're creating that little bullseye each time, which is really important. Because that's where you want them to home in on for that quick bite. The tighter you can focus these fish, the better. And I don't want to be hooking their tails or their posteriors. I want to be hooking them in the mouth. So if the fish is six inches away from your hook bait, that's when you're in danger of hooking some other part of its anatomy. Keep everything nice and tight, hook bait right on top of that little pile, and you will hook more fish. The best anglers I know at this game are supremely accurate. There's a time and a place for fishing around your feed, but for this little method, at this time of day, keep it nice and tight. You can actually see the little pinpricks and everything from that ground bait. Surprisingly active actually. All the little oils and that and bits of air bubbles and that coming out. Not loads of fish coming in, just an odd one keeps coming in. There's one there now. Definitely one there now. Come on, come to Johnny. <laughs> so you don't miss many bites with this short hook length and bulk. They're normally just on. I'm catching all sizes today. It's a medium one. Nicely hooked. The side of the mouth, side or top, I'm happy. Normally, this dorsal just caught a little bit. Right, let's put neat, neat pellets in again. Put them in loose this time. I'm just mixing it up. We on six. We get a slight cloud off those pellets because they're quite stodgy. The, on the very wet side of, of damp, shall we say. But they're still in pellet form. I think my mate Jamie says he calls them double wetting, which is not a bad description. Well, that was a quicker reaction on just pellets. It feels 
like a bigger fish as well. Number seven. Might be a carp. Ooh, just wrapped round him. Oh no, he's in the mouth. For a minute there, I thought he was foul up. He's not. Oh, he's in the nostril. <laughs> Near his mouth. And that's it, that's as easy as it gets. So we're going to feed even less now. When there's some fish there, you don't need to feed much. The more you feed, the less likely they are to take your hook bait. Pop them in. Nice and tight. Oh, straight away. Oh, and a little tail pattern. So I'll obviously spook one then. Didn't like that, did he? Still something there. They'll be back. And in greater numbers. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop recording now because someone's coming. Right, I've just had a couple of guys come say hello, some from my old canal days. So I've stopped for a chat and I've had four fish whilst I've been talking to them, including a very little scrappy common that unfortunately broke me up length in the landing net because it went on a bit of a death roll. Now my phone's going off. I'll ring that again in a bit. Bring them back in a bit. <laughs> I'll try and catch one or two more fish and then we'll knock it on the head because I'm going to have a gang of people come for a chat in a minute and I don't want to be rude to them so we'll stop and have a chat because they're all my old canal friends and we'll reminisce about the good old days on the canal. It's all right. Oh, yeah, you? Say hi to you? That's okay. You okay? Yeah, is it, what, is it 10 or 12 of you? Yeah. I just stopped, I've been coaching for a bit. I've just stopped on uh, on Jenny's, but I just thought I'd stop on here out out the wind. <laughs> yeah, you can do. Yeah, yeah. You just find the nicest bottom, really. A big fish. <laughs> that is a big fish. I would say that's a big common or mirror that. The way he went off. Might be a nice fish. I'm just filming, so it might be a nice fish to end on. <laughs> yeah, ten to twelve. You could you could fish twelve to fourteen to be fair. Big fish this. Ten to twelve is perfect. Uh, it's a bit too light at the moment. Yeah, all all my green eight to tens have been um, have been ditched at the moment till it gets cooler. Unless I'm on top pool when there's some silvers about. Big carp, this. You don't. It'd be nice. The wind's right for it. Well, that's a nice fish to end on. Five or six pound. Oh, give me a nice slap on the wrist. That's a scorcher. And we'll end on that. And we'll carry on having a chat about the good old days on the canal. <laughs> That'll do. Looks tiny on that camera, I bet. But uh, it's probably five pound, that. Lovely. Well, the session got cut short a little bit. We've been too busy gassing and reminiscing about the Shropshire Union Canal and things like that. So uh, yeah, it's been good though. So I've caught 
caught uh, quite a lot of fish actually in such a short space of time ended with a nice little common carp i've probably caught five or six fish uh whilst i've been gassing as well with uh, about four people stood behind me um and we've had a little walk around i've shown some pegs and where to fish because they're here tomorrow as well so uh um but yeah it's been good it's been nice but nice put those uh um little tank floats through their paces as well um very very simple tactics but very very effective and to be honest i'd do exactly the same if i was fishing sort of over there as well tight across um very very little would change um but it's nicer and faster and everything to be doing it nice and close in so uh but yeah hopefully that's whetted your appetite for a little bit of uh f1 and carp margin action very close in on short kits and uh little short stubby floats and very very simple tactics but very very enjoyable as well Right, let's see what we've got. Just probably an hour's fishing. Plenty of fish. Must be 30 pound of fish. See them going back. <laughs> All exactly there as well. That's where I've caught them and that's where they've gone back. Brilliant.